Yeah, hello. Um, I'm going to present the uh, uh, Clarion Language Resource Switchboard, which um, I think has the potential to become a new pillar uh, for the Clarion infrastructure. Um, I will start with the motivation behind the switchboard, uh, walk you uh, through the system using a couple of screenshots, um, discuss uh, the architecture of the switchboard, um, and uh, at the end, discuss uh, some open issues and conclude. Okay, so um, Clarion offers um, uh, its users um, uh, access to a wide range of, of, of language resources. Um, there is, of course, the Virtual Language Observatory, which you all know, where users can perform uh, a search based on metadata to find the resources of their interest. There is the federated content search where you can perform a full text search on resources. But um, once you have um, found your resource of interest, I think most of you would like to do something uh, with the resource in one way or the other. Um, and um, for this you need tools. Um, for the time being, there is no such thing like, uh, say, the virtual tool observatory, which gives you um, access to all the tools of the Clarion community. And there are a number of tools uh, that are available. The switchboard um, builds uh, upon this idea of this virtual tool registry, but it aims to be a little bit more. Um, the motivation is that if you have identified a resource of your interest, uh, the switchboard would like to suggest uh, would like to suggest you um, tools which you can use to process um, your resource. Um, so the idea is um, um, you have a resource that you make uh, may uh, make known to the switchboard. The switchboard uh, does some magic, identifies all the tools uh, that are available in the current community. They can do something with your resource. Um, um, you uh, select tool in question, and then the switchboard starts the tool for you with the resource uh, you have in mind. Okay, so how does it look like? Uh, here you see um, um, the standalone version of the switchboard, which we have used as, as our main development vehicle. But uh, it seems that it's quite popular and it will stay. Um, what you can do with the standalone version, you, uh, you, you take your resource from your file system and drag and drop it into this dotted area. Right? And uh, what happens then is uh, on, uh, uh, on this page, an information pane opens, which uh, tells you what the switchboard knows about your resource. It knows the file name, it knows the file size, but it also tries to uh, deduce from the, resources, uh, from the resource um, its MIME type and the language the resource is in. Um, uh, what happens also as a side effect is that your resource from your, file, from your local file system is uploaded to a centralized server uh, because the tool that is going to process your resource needs access to the resource and it's going to fetch the resource from this, from this upload server. Of course, the switchboard can be wrong uh, with deducing uh, the language and the MIME type, so the user has the possibility to correct this information. There's a pop-down menu where you choose the correct uh, language and the correct MIME type. With, textual, uh, with plain text files, it's quite accurate, but with other file formats like PDF or Word documents, sometimes the language it deduces is, is just wrong. Okay, you also notice there is a little switch uh, uh, and there is a button show tools. If you, uh, if you activate the switch, uh, the button will change to show tools and web services uh, because we also recently included web services in, in our uh, tool registry. Um, so what you do is you click on show tools once you're happy with the information you provided and then um, the browser will show you the list of all tools that could do something with your resource. And it's a task-oriented view, so there's a task, for instance, tokenization or lemmatization, voice synthesis, and there are, uh, in total, a dozen of tasks um, that we have currently 
um, in uh, tools that can uh, do a dozen of tasks um, which you have registered with the, with the switchboard. Uh, so let's say you want to do lemmatization. You can click on, on one of those two tools that offer such service, and when you uh, open, when you click on such a tool like Weblicht, you get more information about the tool, its name, a short description, uh, some contact information, and um, the button click to start tool. And here's where the magic happens. You click on start tool, and then Weblicht opens. But it doesn't open in a standard way. It opens uh, at the right point in time. Weblicht has magically downloaded the resource from the upload server, and it has selected the correct easy chain for tokenization, and all you have to do is press the start button. And that works for all the other tools that we have integrated with, uh, into the switchboard. So that's really nice. Um, OK. Um, um, this was the standalone version. But the version that we have integrated with the switchboard, uh, with, the, with the VLO, works basically the same. And it's already uh, operational. So if you are in the VLO, you might have noticed these uh, little dots once you have selected a record uh, and all the resources associated with the record, if you click on the three dots, you get this um, process with the uh, switchboard information. You click on it, and then you're back to the slide where your resource will show up in the switchboard. You can correct information. You can select your tool, start your tool, and, and off you go. We are also going to integrate um, um, the switchboard with the federated content search. This is, the, this is a doctored screenshot. It's not working yet. So users of uh, the federated content search will probably notice that we replaced um, um, the, uh, the button on the top right-hand side, uh, which showed WebList with switchboard. Uh, so in the future, you will just click on the switchboard and be direct, and your resource will be directly to the switchboard where you get the same uh, workflow that I just illustrated. And that's a doctored screenshot uh, of the virtual collection registry. Here you see a collection of Henrik Ibsen. Associate are a couple of resources, and you see more or less the same um, design that uh, we have already using, that we're already using with the virtual language observatory. Okay. Um, um, there is a specification document for the switchboard, which is available um, online on the Clarin website. Um, I will briefly walk you um, um, uh, through the architecture. Um, let's just use the architecture picture here. Um, there's a front end, which I've just showed to you, and there's a back end. Um, the front end had this drop area where you can just drag and drop your files. It has this resource information pane, and then you have the list of all applicable tools. Uh, let's look at the back end. It has three main components. Uh, one component is the tool registry, where we ask uh, tool developers to send us metadata that describes the tools. And I will show you uh, an example of such tool metadata um, in a minute. Then there's the profiler. The profiler is the component that is responsible for identifying relevant metadata from the resource uh, that we need to find applicable tools. Right? Not all tools can do everything with every resource. Uh, they can only do stuff with uh, certain resources of certain types. And the profiler tries to identify this information um, um, from the resource or from uh, available metadata about the resource. And then in the middle, there is the matcher who brings together the information uh, computed by the profiler and the information that is available um, in, the, in, the, in the tool registry uh, and um, tries to uh, compute uh, the list of all applicable um, tools. Um, for the time being, um, um, the profiler is relatively simple. It only looks for the MIME type of the resource and the language the resource is in. Other information might be necessary or will be necessary, maybe in the future, but that's what we are currently using. 
So the match is also relatively simple. It also has to look for those pieces of information in the tool metadata and, uh, and nothing else. And the app registry is just a set of, uh, of metadata, um, which is basically um, a data structure. Okay, so a bit uh, of technology. Um, yeah, the app registry is, is a adjacent data structure a list of, um, of attribute value pairs. The matcher is simple JavaScript. Um, uh, as I said, only using MIME type and language as the two main criteria to uh, find applicable tools. And the profiler um, 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 is also relatively simple. When uh, the switchboard is called from the VLO, the VLO passes metadata to the switchboard because the VLO has the metadata about the resource. So from the VLO, we get the MIME type and the language. Uh, this might not always be correct. I will come to that later. Um, in the standalone version, we don't have metadata. You just drag and drop a resource into this drop area. So we have um, um, uh, a MIME type detection uh, in place, and we have a language detection in place using Apache uh, Tika libraries. And of course, there's user intervention where the users can correct the information if, if uh, our uh, detection uh, uh, returns the wrong uh, results. Okay, here you see an example of a tool entry for the switchboard. Uh, some of these information is displayed when you ask for more information about the tool, like the tool's name or the contact details or where the uh, tool is hosted. Um, um, but there's also information, of course, uh, require, um, uh, relevant for the profiler, in particular the MIME type um, and the languages the tools support. This is actually an older entry of WebList. Um, it shows that um, the MIME type it supports is only text plain. Uh, we recently um, uh, also added PDF and Word documents. Um, uh, to this metadata, so um, that list will also show up as applicable tool if you want to do, say, lemmatization for on, on uh, documents in Word format. Um, you also see at the last, um, uh, at the bottom of the tracing uh, structure, parameters. Uh, here, you, the, here you specify what kind of parameters um, should the switchboard send to the tool, say to WebList, so that the tool starts at the right time. Right? Of course, we pass on uh, the input, you know, a reference to the resource, where the tool can download the resource. Uh, but we also, here in WebList, we pass on the language information uh, and the analysis information. Um, so uh, WebList uh, wants to see analysis as a parameter and the word NE uh, and it will do named entity recognition if, it will start with named entity recognition if called uh, with such parameterization. Okay, uh, some tools may like other parameters to be passed. We try to minimize the adaption efforts required by tool providers to get registered with the switchboard. So here you see a mapping where the parameters are mapped to the parameters that the systems understand. They don't have to change their parameters. The switchboard does that for you. Okay, here's an example uh, of how um, WebList is, um, is invoked. Yeah, you see a reference to the file, uh, some encoding of the MIME type and the language, uh, and um, that's what usually the tools get from the switchboard. Okay, a bit about the state of the, of the switchboard. We have uh, 35 tools uh, currently registered with the switchboard, and we have uh, a dozen of web services. Uh, we are very close to uh, the end of the implementation phase, end of October. There will be, of course, some time left to improve the switchboard. Um, uh, the integration with the uh, federated content search and the virtual collection registry is still to be done. That's mostly work on their side, not on the switchboard side. And of course, we would like to increase the participation of more tools, uh, need serious usability testing, um, and take this input into account to iter iteratively improve um, the switchboard. 
yeah, there are a couple of open issues. Maybe uh, I don't talk about all six of them. Uh, let me take two or three out of them. There's the data curation aspect that has an impact on the usability. So uh, sometimes the VLO has wrong uh, information, wrong metadata about the resource, say the MIME type. Um, you, uh, in, the, in the VLO, it says that the resource is a plain text file, but in reality, it's not plain. It's enriched with some kind of annotations. Of course, if you start uh, uh, passing this to the switchboard, and the switchboard lists all applicable tools, and then you start the tools, and when you look at the tool results, then you figure out, oh, it actually was not plain text. It was something else. So that's, uh, that's something which, uh, which has a negative impact on the usability. Uh, accessibility, legal, and privacy. Um, sometimes uh, you pass a resource to the switchboard, you look at all the applicable tools, you select one, and then tool, the tool tries to download the resource. But then the tool is not allowed to download the resource. It doesn't have the missing credentials. Or you would like to start a tool, but you don't have the, access, you don't have the, right, the proper rights to start the tools. Right? So we have to figure out some user delegation issues um, um, with that. Yeah, maybe interoperability as a very last uh, point here. Um, the switchboard's task is really uh, simple. Just identify applicable tools, you select ones, you start it, and that's where the switchboard's task end. Right? There is no communication between the switchboard and the tool. The switchboard doesn't know if the tool was successful. It doesn't get anything back from the tool. It just opens in a new browser tab and you know, Switchboard is ignorant of, of what happens. That might want to, we, might, we might want to change that in the future, but they're not really working together in the sense of more than what I just said. And that, might, uh, um, that, uh, that is an issue that we might address. Okay, so um, uh, I'd like to uh, invite you to the bazaar this afternoon where I give you a, a, a demo of the switchboard, a live demo, given that Wi-Fi works. Uh, I like to encourage all the de developers uh, to consider their tools for integration with the switchboard. There's not too much adaption that you have to do other than understanding URL parameters that I pass on to you and then figuring out how you make your tool advance through a state such that the user doesn't have to enter all the information again. Um, I also encourage you to use the standalone version and um, give me feedback uh, as much as possible. Okay, thank you very much. One more question, yeah. Um, we're actually working on, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, on uh, metadata descriptions for our tools that we have yeah. uh, in SIMD. And I think that most of the information that you require in the registry is in our metadata, mm -hmm. but do you have uh, uh, yourself a particular um, um, component or uh, profile for uh, representing this information in uh, SIMD uh, so that you can automatically extract it or fill the registry f with information from the, the, from, the, from the metadata records in the, in the flow, yeah. actually, yeah. from the tools? Um. Well, at the moment, uh, we are using this JSON structure that I've just shown. Uh, on one of the slides, I had this issue management. So how do you manage when a tool developer would like to add his or her tool to the registry? At the moment, you have to send me some information, and I construct the JSON structure. So maybe we should talk that we uh, can. But what we can also offer, and may, that might make sense in the future, that, that uh, there will be some kind of um, form that you have to fill out with all the information that is required by uh, the tool registry, and then such a record will be automatically uh, created. Well, my suggestion was everybody who makes a tool must make also metadata for that tool, so a SIMD record, and the yeah. SIMD record should contain enough information so that you can extract all, yeah. all that you need for uh, the switchboard. Yeah. That's, yeah. The, I, I, that's yeah. what I would like to work on. Y yes, um, but uh, keep in mind, um, I mean, there, there must be some kind of human supervision. I'm happy to take your metadata, and then your tool will show up. But if I want to start your tool, it should also work. So, so there's passing all the information to the tool, and the tool starts at the right time that has to be tested and worked, and it's not always working as expected. So uh, uh, just adding your metadata without any additional work, that, that, that won't work. 
Thank you. Um, Konrad Smet, Norway. Um, so in connection with uh, the previous question, and also taking into account that there are indeed lots more tools available, and also um, at least two more workflow systems in Claren, yeah. um, it seems like there's going to be still a lot of work, and you're running towards the end of your project. But what is, what is the future strategy? Is this sustainable? Will this be, be maintained? And, and how, how does one cooperate? Uh, so that, that was the first small question. I have a second small question, and it is, uh, is it so that um, some of the tools actually run in your environment? Or is everything just passed on and runs completely remotely? Yeah, so the first question, uh, the good news is there is some time left. I mean, Clarion Plus, uh, that's work carried out in the Clarion Plus project. And in Clarion Plus, which runs till August last year, we have some time left because we started late. So the version I presented is just the minimal 1.0 version. But there is uh, a few person month to, to uh, incorporate user feedback, and you get more tools listed. Um, um, the second question is, uh, the only tool that runs uh, at the moment uh, in Tübingen itself is Weblicht, um, um, which we have changed so that it starts at the right point. And for Weblicht, we have also kind of uh, deactivated the authentic authentication process uh, because we wanted to have maximum usability and we found it a bit uh, distracting if y you start a tool and the first thing you have to look for your credentials. So the current version of Weblist is not asking for your credentials. But other tools like, uh, um, I think, um, uh, the Clam Web Services or Ukto or so, they ask you for your credentials and you have to have an account. And that's also something that we have to figure out. So uh, how does it work? Should there be a, a user login for the switchboard? And then you have automatically access to all the tools and all the resources, single sign on. Uh, so uh, the tool providers also have to figure out how, if they all uh, would uh, go via the Shibboleth single sign on service and not do their own thing to improve the usability. Okay, last question. Okay, two last questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, there are many cases where where the right tool for a given piece of data is not a, a web service but a, a desktop standalone tool. Take a, a, a BART file or something. Um, I'm not sure I understood what the switchboard does in these cases. Does it simply take you to the download page for the tool, or do um, you do you assume that usually people will want um, web services or? Yeah, so uh, the starting point for the switchboard was only uh, register tools which run on, in a web browser or which are available as a web service. If there are tools that to be installed on your, on your local desktop machine, they are not in the, t in, in the switchboard catalog. Um, I forgot to say, uh, on the home page of the switchboard, at the top right corner, there is also a button show all tools or show all tools and web services if you want to include the web services. But again, this only shows the tools and web services that run in the web browser or as a web service. What we could do is we could extend this list and have some kind of desktop uh, variants where the only information you're getting is uh, the metadata information and the homepage of the tool uh, and maybe a download link. If this is what the community wants, I can easily uh, put such information in. And then we would have a more complete virtual tool registry, also including tools that you have to install yourself before working with them. But then, of course, the switchboard can't forward the resource to the tool. You have to do it manually. I mean, one, one add-on, uh, last 45 seconds. <laughs> oh, there's another question is, uh, the switchboard is also not designed as a workflow engine. So, so the interoperability among the tools is, is quite low. Um, so when you, when you have a resource, uh, you use the switchboard uh, to get it processed with some tool. Of course, you can then from the tool download the result and feed it back into the switchboard to then ha call another tool. Right? But uh, that's, that's also manual work. The last question. Um, the um, granularity of the description in the VLO differs widely. So sometimes you have one record for a complete, let's say, corpus, and sometimes you have one record per 
let's say, yeah. text. Yeah. Uh, can you apply uh, the uh, tool to a series, to a, a, a set of uh, selections from the thing? And can you apply it to a big corpus that consists of multiple folders, uh, multiple, uh, maybe even zip files? I don't know what's, what's behind yeah. it. Yeah. So at the moment, it only works for a single file uh, upload. Um, uh, there is no batch mode where you can just say, I have dozens of text files and, and I would like to have them batch processed by, by, some, uh, by some tool. That's not currently possible. The same holds for zip files. Um, that adds a bit of a complexity uh, because you have to unzip the files and then things can go wrong and you have to know what, uh, and then the MIME type might not be correct. So from the usability of point of view, I, I experimented a bit with uploading multiple files, getting multiple uh, information panes for each file. And uh, that's also the reason why you had a show tool on each information pane, that because then you can just focus on one resource, get it processed, then a tab opens, you forget about the tab, you uh, start the next one. It's, so it's a manual process. But it, from the usability point of view, it doesn't, didn't look very good. So I stopped it for the time being. Um, and then, of course, there are, uh, there are services like the WebLeaf as a service, uh, where we can process larger files or call it in the batch mode. So here the switchboard is not offering too much for you at the moment. Okay, thank you again. Yeah.